Hey, everybody. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me okay? I'm not hearing anything, so I just want to verify that you can hear me. Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I hear everyone. There we go. I think that's better. Can you say something again? Test, test. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, great. So, um, I'm pretty wiped out because I'm in the middle of a, I saw my note that I'm in the middle of the, my busiest two weeks of the year at work and it's almost, it's winding down, but I won't be done until uh, Saturday or Sunday. So, um, what I wanted to do first was just, you know, does anybody have any questions about any of this stuff? Um, that we're working on this week uh, before I, you know, I, I'm not planning to talk a lot tonight just because I don't have a whole lot of energy. No questions? Hmm. Oh, I to... don't see. see that we're doing the uh, signed email, the seventh objective, and the uh, quiz on encryption policies, right? And there's also um, open SSL. Yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen. Oops, that's not the screen sharing one. So, um, yeah, so here's SSL. Um, there are uh, these instructions are if you're doing it from the command line, which is actually what I usually do when I work with SSL. Um, and this there's uh, instructions for doing it with Windows. And this uh, how-to, as I recall, is pretty good. You know, it shows you all the commands. Um, this is the one that's probably the most uh, challenging if you do it from the command line. As far as the assignment goes this week, uh, people usually report that uh, doing using the GUI in Windows is fairly easy. You know, the advantage to doing it to the command line is that it really um, it gets you to um, it asks you questions and kind of makes you think. And it'll help you understand SSL uh, a bit better. And uh, so that's one of the things that I like about doing the command line. You know, it'll ask you your city, your state, your country as you're running the commands, uh, the name of the business. Um, you can set how long the certificate's good for before it expires, you know, and all the expectation is here is to just create the certificate. You know, if we were doing a slightly different kind of class, I would probably have you insert the certificate into Apache to create um, an HTTPS um, web server. Uh, but that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing. So I just kind of have you go through how you create the certificate and uh you know if you wind up doing stuff with web apps you will need certificates and you know the experience of creating them is really uh useful 
and if you're creating web apps you know eventually you're going to be sending your certificates off to a certificate signing authority so that uh if somebody's doing say e-commerce with you you can have ver you know the signing service will verify that your certificate is good and that you are who you say you are if you're using certificates for internal use only uh, you could just self-sign them. If you self-sign them, you'll get a warning in the web browser that says it can't verify the authenticity of the certificate. And uh, if you've self-signed it, you know it's your certificate, it's not a big deal. And you can, you know, usually have to go to click on an advance button so that you can say accept the certificate and, and you're good to go. Uh, and you know if it's as i said for internal use i think that's fine and you know you just got to give everybody the instruction uh for working with the general public definitely you do not want to self-sign uh because if you're telling people oh it's okay and for your site it might be they might think it's okay for the next site and if somebody's uh say doing a man in the middle attack and they're using a bogus certificate they're going to give away a whole bunch of data <laughs> so um for the general public you have to you really do have to use a signing authority but if it's internal use especially uh among a relatively small number of people you just say we're signing our own certificate for us this is okay you know you'd want to educate the user base and so you say you know for us this is okay um if you run into this kind of thing going someplace else, you'll want to check out before you proceed to make sure that that certificate, it really is okay. And then it's not a bogus certificate and someone's trying to intercept data along the way. Uh, so, but uh, I like working with SSL. It's uh, doing it at the command line. It does take a little getting used to. It can be intimidating the first few times you do it. And then, you know, it's not that big a deal. Um, GUIs hide some of the questions from you. And, and, you know, unless you're like in advanced mode. Uh, and so, you, you know, the disadvantage of, the GUI, of doing the GUI method is that you don't understand as well what it is that you're doing with the certificate. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, if you want to, if you uh, educate yourself on the certificate and you, you understand what's going on with the certificate, then, you know, in some cases, GUIs are faster and, and you know, they'll guide you a little more in the questioning process than the command line does. And, uh, you know, if it's faster and it works better for you, you know, have at it. But, you know, if you're, if you're going to do a lot of SSL, I would make sure that for the, the experience, you do it from the command line because it'll, it'll force you to learn a little more about all of the different aspects of the certificate so that if you're managing a server and you're using certificates and somebody questions you about your certificate, you know, they're, you know, they're like, well, it was signed, but, you know, we, we have some sort of doubt. And you just know a little bit more about the certificate creation, you can more easily put their mind to rest, or if you might be like, oh, that something about that certificate looks odd. You know, as has somebody, um, do I have a compromised key? Do I need to revoke the certificate? Uh, so, you know, they're, they're used so much these days, you know, aside from SSL, there are um, VPNs that do use certificates to uh, open the VPN tunnel. You're not passing a username and password or anything like that. You use certificate keys on both ends to open the tunnel. There's, there's lots of different things that certificates use are used for. Uh, they're pretty cool. So any questions about certificates? 
you know, if you're if you're feeling motivated, I would encourage you to try both the command line and um, the GUI method. Certainly not required. Uh, the last time around that I did the class, uh, the vast majority of people did the GUI method, but I had uh, three or four people that uh, really liked the command line, and they and they were like, "Oh, well, I'm not doing the GUI because." I prefer the command line. Uh, there's not that many people running around like that these days. But the, as I said, it, it, it would be good to go through the process because it will educate you. Um, and occasionally, uh, you know, you'll run into something as you're going through a how-to where um, – something doesn't make sense to you you know the uh, i've i've walked through these how to's not recently but i've walked through the how to and uh and they do work uh you know it can be easy to skip a step or sometimes you misread what's there uh like you know linux if you're applying switches it's a dash and in windows it's a forward slash right yeah um, so, you know, there's little syntax differences that if you're, if you're reading a how to, and it was originally written for Linux and they're applying switches, you might need to, uh, and you're doing a command line in windows, you might need to adapt some of the syntax if it was originally written for Linux or vice versa. If it was command line and somebody wrote it for windows, uh, you might need to adapt it to, to Linux and just being aware that you don't use slashes, you use dashes for to apply the switches to the commands. Um, one of the things in the tutorial, when I when I change windows, does the uh, does the share screen change when I change um tabs? Does it change the browser tabs? Do you see what I see? Yes, it does. Okay, good. Um so in here, there's the first steps. They give you a little dis brief description of each command. So that's to create the certificate authority, um, the encrypt and decrypt, generate your RSA. Um, so one of the things that you can, that as you go through here, let me just find. Uh, Key, key gener there we are, key generation. So right here, you know, that that's 1024-bit encryption. Um, and, you know, if you think you need a higher level encryption, you can certainly change that as long as the encryption algorithm that you uh, are using supports a higher level. You know, so after 1024, the next step would be 2048. And, you know, fortunately, you know, in this, it shows a fairly typical response that you get when you execute the command. It'll tell you it's generating the private key. And then it tells you here, you know, it's got both the public key and a private key and the private key you need to keep secure. Uh, you, you know, if you're handing out keys, you only hand out the public key, not the private key. Um, and yeah, you can look at the details of the of the key pairs if you want to. That's not essential, but this is. This is one of those things where you're, there's your input key, your output key, and it'll ask you to put in your password or passphrase. Um, and this is where you're creating the public key um, for distribution, which is handy. Um, and then getting down to the digital signature so and it has a nice little description of public key infrastructure which is pki 
you know, the book has a lot of that information too, but it won't have the specifics. You know, all of these things in gray are specifics about uh, generating keys and working on the uh, infrastructure. So here, it's showing you the an, a sample OpenSSL configuration file. And then if you wanna create the PKI, there's the actual CA key PEM, and then you have the CA certificate authority cert. And then you have the creation of the user certificate down here. So um, there are lots of how to's out there. If this one doesn't make sense to you, um, I've used a variety of them over the years. Um, this one is really, if you're, is designed, if you want to create all of the different parts of the PKI in infrastructure. Um, and so there, there's some value in going through that exercise. You know, if you want, if you're just interested in creating the certificate, you could look for another how to on just creating the certificate and not do some of the other stuff that this is, um, doing here. Yeah, if you wanted to create and if you wanted to do self-signed certificates specifically, you could set, do a search for how to create self-signed certificates. Uh, I've used self-signed certificates a fair amount. Uh, as I said, it's usually for private kind of stuff, not public consumption. And uh, so that's... Um, pretty cool now hop into my email compose said compose there we are so the final button so uh, you know for your there's this feature that um i wasn't aware of in google if you're going to do the signed email where you have confidential mode and is this button where you can turn it on. So um, options for some forward copy print or download this email's contents will be disabled. Um, you can require a passcode. Um, so this is kind of a handy little feature. It's slightly different than using PGP. Um, but it's, you know, it's another way to do that email. It, it, hush mail is pretty cool. The way hush mail works. Um, well, I don't want to get my drive. Um, this one. Really, the way hush mail works is, uh, it will, you know, you'll write an email to somebody and, they'll get a note that says they have an email, but they actually have to follow a link in that email that they got, that they click on, which will take them back to the um, Hushmail server and, and they read it through, you know, an encrypted session with SSL um, and you can require a password and so on. And so that's kind of a cool concept for secure email. Uh, and then if you use PGP, you can actually encrypt the email. Uh, a couple of you have sent me PGP, um, or signed, signed emails and, you know, that's another way to do it. Um, I don't know if anybody that's providing a web-based mail service provides uh, actual PGP encryption on the server for you to send PGP emails. Most people that are doing um, PGP are using a mail client. And so the, the mail client, um, the PGP will um, interact with the mail client to, pro to provide the encryption. Uh, it's a little more work and, you know, and I, I don't use mail clients anymore. I do all web-based mail these days. Um, but if you're, you know, if you want to have kind of the, oh, 
high highest level of personal control um and not have the people providing your service service doing any of the encryption that you want it you want to be in control of the actual encryption yourself pgp could be the way to go um you know pgp has been hacked and i don't know if they've upped their uh level encryption you know i wasn't aware of the hack until um last semester where um somebody had found out about the pgp hack and and had talked about it in um in one of the forums and i hadn't heard about it so um that is a a consideration uh and you know if you really were serious about using pgp that could be worth a little research into um have they upped their game to to make it more secure you know of course you know pgp stands for pretty good privacy and it's not you know ap absolute privacy so you know they're not saying that it's uh foolproof either you know so it comes down to uh you know personal preferences and you know if you really need secure email you know which approach best suits your needs and if you're part of an organization what best suits the organization's needs uh you know and if you're running your own me email server then you can look into how do you provide uh secure mail from your mail server uh that's not something that i've done and so you know i would look up a how to how do i run a you know a web server that provides a encryption or, or a mail server that provides encryption similar to pgp and there's probably a how-to out there on it i haven't looked for one i've never had the need to do that you know um my own feeling about running mail servers is if you don't have to don't <laughs> they're um they're notoriously difficult to configure because you have to have three separate server services that are working properly. You need to have DNS working properly. If DNS does not work properly, your mail will not work. So I've, I've known people that were running their own mail servers and they were beating their heads against the wall because they couldn't find a problem in their SMTP server configuration or in their IMAP or POP3 server configuration. And it turned out that they had forgotten to like create the MX record in DNS, which is required for uh, internet email to work. <laughs> so there's, you know, there's three different server services that you have to use to, to make email just work. And if you misconfigure one of them, figuring out which one you got wrong can take some time. And then mail is constantly under attack. Uh, you know, people are trying to pass viruses through email, phishing scams, spam. Uh, you know, running a mail server is easily a full-time job or multiple full-time jobs, depending upon, you know, the volume of mail clients that you have to support. And uh, I would only run it if you have a large enough IT staff to do it. You know, if I were to, you know, go back into IT full time and somebody hired me and, you know, and I was uh, a one or two person tech support shop for the organization. And, you know, if my predecessor had been running email in addition to all kinds of other things, the first thing I would broach with the powers of B would be to outsource email because it is so much work. And uh, as I said, it, it, it is a full time, it should be a full time job. Uh, you sh if you're doing email, you really shouldn't have other responsibilities if your organization is large enough. And if your organization is not large enough, 
you don't want it because you don't want the headache. <laughs> you have enough to deal with, you know, so many administrators in Vermont are jack of all trades. Um, that And mail is so complicated and such a security problem. I think it's better if you're, unless your organization is large enough where it's compelling to run your own mail server that you just outsource it. Uh, you know, you use the the Google suite or or somebody, you know, one of Google's competitors, whatever. Um, Cause it is under constant attack and you have to watch it vigilantly. And, you know, you need to run things like spam assassin and ant antivirus um, scanners that are designed specifically to run on an email server. And uh, there's just, there's, there's so much there that, you can get into a lot of aggravation that you don't need. Um, I've known people where, you know, the, back in the early days of email, a lot of the email servers by default were set up as open relays, which meant that anybody from anywhere could bounce mail off your server. And, you know, when it was an open relay, you, you know, you'd set it up and it just worked and you'd be like, Hey, I'm pretty cool. I got email to work. Um, but then people would start bamming, bouncing spam off of you. And I knew people that got blacklisted. And once you get blacklisted, it's really hard to get off the blacklist. And, uh, and you have, there are some steps that you have to go through to prove that you have taken appropriate steps to eliminate uh, people bouncing spam off of you. And uh, a friend of mine, you know, he said he's retired now. He said to me, yeah, you know, I didn't know any better when I set up my first mail server. It was an open relay. It was working fine for a while. And then all of a sudden I was getting these messages that people weren't accepting mail from us. And we had gotten on a blacklist because it was an open relay. And I didn't know that. And uh, it took him months to get him off all, get himself, get his organization off of all of the blacklists. Um, you know, that this was like, probably 20 years ago now. Uh, but again, you know, there are so many details in email that it's really easy to just make a mistake. And then you're in the situation where people are bouncing spam off of you or you're, you're, um, you got worms going through your email server or, you know, or you get, viruses coming through if you don't have your antivirus software up to snuff for mail scanning it, it's a lot of work so you know I, I personally you know i would use a service rather than run that myself if if i wanted to um be responsible for secure arranging for secure email for an organization unless I was really big and a large IT staff I just I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole not everybody feels that way but uh, I used to teach intermediate Linux at CCV they don't offer the class anymore and we set up a mini internet in intermediate Linux and I've set up mail a whole bunch of times but my advice to the students in intermediate Linux class was always, if you don't have to do this, don't. <laughs> so um, I think that's, you know, kind of it for tonight, unless people have questions. I'm just running out of time. Are we all good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Well, um, I, nobody came in on Sunday. Our next one is a week from Sunday. And maybe when we haven't had one, you know, when we have that long stretch, maybe I'll try to send a note out either the day before or that morning just to remind people that, you know, the option is uh, available. So, but I'll talk to you all in a week and a half or so. Sounds good. See ya. Okay. Have a good night. Too.
Some raised hands. Uh, yeah. Um, I can't make that next Sunday one. Okay. Um, I'm assuming there'll be a recording. Um, or, uh, May has been pretty good about making recordings. So, although I'm not sure that they can do Sunday. Um, I'll ask, um, someone to make a recording. Um, okay. No big deal. Um, I could, I guess if you just want to, like, if there's anything that you go over that, like a lot of people had questions on or something. Yep. Usually uh, what I, you know, um, Usually what I try to do is mention what I talked about, you know, um, so that if it needs to, if I need to go over it, especially if it's completely different people, I may talk about exactly the same thing. Um, and if it's, if there's an overlap in people, I might mention what we talked about. And then um, if people want me to go over it, I will, or I might move on to something else. So... Okay. Yeah, I, I could do the recording myself. Um, it's just usually, you know, I kind of get focused on what it is I want to accomplish, and I don't think of it at the time. So, um, you know, I would actually, I would rather delegate it so that I don't have to think about it. So if, um, I'll try to remember to ask uh, if someone will manage that on the Wednesday the, on the next uh, Sunday conference okay yeah perfect um, oh, okay um, anything else because I thought I saw that there were two raised hands okay all right have a good night Oh, I see the I see this question here um, about the SSL TLS. TLS is the successor to SSL, so technically they're not identical, but they kind of go hand in hand. So, um, okay. All right. Have a good night.